We do have a quorum, so I'll call this meeting to order. Would you please join me for a moment of silence? And the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. City Clerk, would you please read the rules to speak today? Yes, sir. This is a City Council meeting to hear special recognitions and presentations. Council will not take any formal action on the agenda items at this meeting. All individuals wishing to speak to so may do so under petitions and requests from the public present. No sign-up card is required. Citizens will be given three minutes to speak. All sign-up cards and exhibits being submitted to City Council shall be placed in the box on the table in the chamber. Thank you. City Manager, special recognitions and presentations, please. Yes, sir, and uh, Council, we are on agenda item 4A. This is the Disability Employment Awareness Month. Ms. Delena Parrish will give a brief presentation on the diversity employment inclusion to the educational aspects of the proclamation. Ms. Parrish works to promote personal empowerment and body confidence by advocating for equal opportunities in life, education, career, and adaptive fashion for those with disabilities. Thank you. And as you come up, Delena, I would like to say that uh, I feel like I've known you your entire life. Um, and and uh, you make me so proud. And you inspire me every day. So thank you for being here. And with that, before you start to speak, I'd like to give you a little thank you. <laughs> Delena Parrish. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give you a very brief background on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and why it's crucial for you to integrate DEI into all of the city of Titusville's planning processes. I'm thrilled that you were able to hear from the leaders of Titusville's Best Buddies chapter at the last meeting. And I am very proud to tell you that our family was one of the club founders and I was their first president. During my term, I was able to spend one-on-one -on -one time with Anthony Kennedy Shriver at the National Leadership Conference. He, and many other local and national business leaders, have challenged me to challenge others, to realign their perception of disability with the potential of leadership, success, profit, and entrepreneurship. But first, there must be education. We must have perspective. Specifically, Tonight, I'm thrilled that you are recognizing NDM, or National Disability Awareness Month within the city of Titusville. I promise it will showcase Titusville in a progressive light to attract new industry and their enlightened employees. So please take a moment to think about how you would define diversity. Perhaps gender, ethnicity, religion, or even sexual orientation might pop into your mind. Until the ADA was signed into law in 1990, people with disabilities were not legally protected in employment, and still many myths exist. But just within the past decade or so, disability, equity, and inclusion has gained steam. In fact, as we speak, it is a red-hot topic in the realm of talent recruitment, in companies of all sizes, in nearly every industry. As society strives to accept the terms and skills associated with differences, a tipping point is occurring. This is defined by a moment in time when a series of small changes become so significant that larger change begins to occur. Attracting, developing, and retaining diversified talent will become more essential to our city as the dynamics of our global workforce shifts. As populations live longer, as the next generation of workforce population demand that their employers embrace acceptance on every human level. Part of this tipping point can be attributed to the global pandemic. While the pandemic temporarily paralyzed and permanently altered much of the employment landscape, doors ironically opened wider for working individuals with disabilities. Within the disability community, where I claim one of my identities, Many of us were able to survive the pandemic with a strange familiarity. 
It offered a window to the able-bodied world just how many of us live. While most of America struggled with the instantaneous lockdown, we knew what to expect from the inequality that disability brings, like accessible transportation, workplace environment, personal accommodations, appearance biases, and more. The normalization of remote working has dissolved many obstacles faced by people with disabilities. It has allowed me to consult with global companies like Toby Dynavox, construction firms at the University of Florida, and statewide nonprofits like the Able Trust located in Tallahassee, all while working remotely. Make no mistake, disruption has its place in innovation, by sheer speed or need. Disruption can renew with a commanding, refreshing perspective. But we cannot, as employers or society, use crisis as our excuse. We must continue to evolve and improve for every person to have the choice to equal access to all the possibilities that Americans are blessed to have. Companies must also understand how the ecosystem of work life and home life exists for people with disabilities. As we rise to create better experiences for all employees, we must ensure people with disabilities are not left out of the conversation, but rather have won in four seats at the table. The theme of this year's National Disability Employment Awareness Month is America's recovery, powered by inclusion. With that, I'm here to encourage you, as local officials, to be the voice of change in the Titusville community and to strive to equalize employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Disability, equity, and inclusion encircles nearly every corporate tenant, social responsibility, impact investing, creative and problem solving from diverse, lived experiences, and, as multiple studies prove, profitability. In fact, $25 billion more profitable. That is the boost the American GDP would receive by hiring an additional 1% of people with disabilities into the workforce. 1%. But, employment numbers presented by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics in as late as 2020 share a stark contrast that national employment for non-disabled civilian individuals with a bachelor's degree or higher stands at 72% while only about 25% of disabled civilian individuals with a degree are employed. That's triple the employment rate gap. That's inequitable and unacceptable. Let me share a little perspective on the topic and why it's relevant. Nearly one in four Americans is living with some form of a disability. 61 million Americans. That can be physical, visual, intellectual or whatever limits one's life and their ability to perform activities of daily living. Globally, that number includes one-fifth of the inhabitants on Earth. What this means is that disability represents the largest minority in the world. To put it in an economic perspective, people with disabilities collectively hold three trillion dollars in disposable income globally. And yet still in 2021, this population has continued to be undermined as both a talent pool as well as a loyal consumer with disposable income. Advocates often claim we are the only true equal opportunity minority in the world. Any culture, any tax bracket, any color, any gender. And you can join at any point in your life. Not just when you're older as most would assume, but when you're six or on your 21st birthday or like me, at birth. While the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 offers numerous protections and directives for how individuals with disabilities must be treated once they're in the workplace, the $25 billion question becomes, how do Florida's 363,000 primary and secondary age students and special education programs even arrive at the place called employment? Or for those like me who were fully mainstreamed with accommodations and attained a bachelor's degree? Quickly, you might wonder where Florida stands right now. According to the Disability Compendium statistics released for 2019, 
They show only 36.2% of Floridians with disabilities are employed compared to 77.6% of Floridians without disabilities. Sadly, that's more than half of the employment rate of able-bodied individuals. That figure has not had a meaningful change in decades. I am humbling standing here as an example of what can work. In public education, with advocates standing next to me my whole life, with an unending work ethic and a degree in hand. Let's bring more people to the table in Titusville and enjoy each other's company. In closing, I'd like to thank Mayor Diesel for his unwavering compassion and attention to our whole community. Because each of us makes our community whole, employment is but one aspect that drives inclusion. This proclamation by Mayor Diesel and you, our City Council members, is a notable first step to raising disability employment awareness. But does awareness itself enact tangible change? My hope and challenge to the Council is to use this proclamation as a catalyst in taking the lead with the local chambers of commerce, employers, and those who identify with a disability, in redirecting the narrative to possibility, innovation and acceptance. This isn't a novelty, but a necessity. Thank you for your kind attention. I will leave a few of my business cards here, so please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Good. Before I come down and do the presentation, I, I said earlier how proud you make me and how much you inspire me, but the more I watch you and what you do and the overwhelming uh, difference you make, uh, your bravery, your passion, your courage, um, we can't put into words. So with that, thank you. I'm honored that you're here, and I'm honored that I get to present you with this in just a moment. So here I come. Thank you. An official proclamation of the city of Titusville, Florida, whereas October 2021 marks the 76th anniversary of the National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And the purpose of the National Disability Employment Awareness Month is to educate about disability employment issues and celebrate the many and varied contributions of American workers with disabilities. And the history of the National Disabilities Employment Awareness Month traces back to 1945 when Congress enacted a law declaring the first week in October each year the National Employ the Physically Handicapped Week. And in 1962, the world physically was removed to acknowledge the employment needs and contributions of individuals with all types of disabilities. And in 1988, Congress expanded the week to a month and changed the name to National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And workplaces welcoming the talents of all people, including people with disabilities, are, crucial, are a crucial part of our efforts to build an inclusive community and a strong economy. And activities during the month will reinforce the value and, talented, and talents of people with disability added to our workforces and communities and affirm that the city of Titusville, Florida's commitment to an inclusive community that increases access to opportunities to all, including individuals with disabilities. Now, therefore, I, Daniel E. Diesel, mayor of the city of Titusville, Florida, by virtue of the authority uh, of said office, I do hereby proclaim October 2021 as Disability Employment Awareness Month, signed Daniel E. Diesel, mayor. Mr. Mayor, if you will. Um, before she leaves, I, I really want to express uh, my thanks uh, not only to uh, what you're doing here with the proclamation, but also um, I'm very honored to be in front of Trish you. and your husband because, J.J., I have seen you all through the years, and you've always been dedicated to your daughter and your kids. Um, and I know it's hard sometimes, but... Um, I always say that, you know, God doesn't put any more on it than you can handle, but this to me is a blessing and it shows where your heart is 
and you have a pure heart for just taking care of your children and your child with special needs. So uh, I, I just appreciate you. I appreciate you, JJ. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very honored that we are able to do this today for sure. So. Uh, next item, Mayor, is a proclamation for veteran small business, um, pro an official proclamation of the city of Titusville, whereas in 2015, a resolution was in introduced by the United States Congress to designate the first week in November as National Veteran Small Business Week. And Brevard County is the home of more than 65,000 veterans and 4,800 veteran-owned firms per the U.S. Census Bureau 2012 Economic Census Survey of business owners. And there are 87,756 veteran-owned businesses in Florida generating $57.7 billion in annual sales. And less than one half of 1% of the U.S. population have served our country in the armed forces, yet veteran-owned businesses represent 9% of all business firms, according to the 2017 Small Business Administration. And the Florida Association of Veteran-Owned Businesses, Space Coast, has over 100 veterans-owned businesses and patriotic supporters, non-veterans -vet businesses as members. And the Florida Association of Veterans-Owned Businesses is a nonprofit entity that advocates education and connects our veteran-owned businesses to the economic opportunities. And the Florida Association of Veteran-Owned Businesses and Small Business Administration have entered into a strategic alliance memorandum as of October 2020. And National Veteran Small Business Week is dedicated to supporting veteran entrepreneurs and business owners and their families and to encourage people to purchase goods and services from these hardworking men and women. And vet Florida veterans and their families deserve our unwavering support and gratitude. Now, therefore, I, Daniel E. Diesel, Mayor of the City of Titusville, Florida, by virtue of the authority of said office do hereby proclaim November 1st through November 5th, 2021 as Veterans Small Business Week. Signed, Daniel E. Diesel, Mayor. Thank you. Those, those words seem like a lot of words, but if you pay attention and, and truly almost have to look at them, the stats and facts on these words um, give an idea of the difference that you guys make every day. Um, it's, it's just amazing to me. So certainly, we thank you as veterans and serving our country. And today we thank you and honor you for what you do with veterans businesses. So thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next <clears throat> proclamation is the Care and Kindness Week. The official proclamation of the city of Titusville, Florida, whereas Pilot International was founded in Macon, Georgia in 1921, this volunteer nonprofit 100-year-old community service organization seeks to promote programs and activities that influence positive change in communities throughout the world through education, volunteerism, financial support, and research. Pilots strive to do more, care more, and be more, and serve their communities by reaching out to those in need. Pilot International is made up of a diverse group of people who celebrate those that give and care to others. Pilot International has been a true, true to its mission to serve communities throughout the world for 100 years. Riverview Pilot Club of Titusville has served the Titusville community since 2013. Therefore, I, Daniel E. Diesel, Mayor of the City of Titusville, Florida, do hereby proclaim the week of 7 through 14 November 2021 as Care and Kindness Week. Signed, Daniel E. Diesel, Mayor. Well, first of all, uh, you're never wrong for declaring a caring, Care and Kindness Week. So that is really good. But when you read this as well, Pilot Club strives to do more, care more, and be more. I can't think of anything better for all of us to strive for. So with that, thank you so very much. Thank you for being here, and thank you for striving to do the things that you do with the Pilot Club. Thank you.
And Mayor and Council, we're now on agenda item 4E, which is the American Rescue Plan Request for Proposal of Supportive Services Presentations. There will be presentations from nonprofit agencies applying for American Rescue Plan Act funding to provide supportive services. There's no action required. On July 13, 2021, City Council approved the Neighborhood Services Department portion of the city's uh, grant program. This approval included allocating $250,000 for support services programs provided by nonprofit organizations. On July 23, 2021, the Neighborhood Services Department issued a request for proposal to interested agencies to provide eligible services that respond to the impacts of COVID-19 on our community. On September 3, 2021, the department received five responses to its RFP as follows. The Boys and Girls Club of Central Florida, Catholic Charities of Central Florida, Christian Life Academy, GROW, G-R-O-W, and North Brevard Charities Sharing Center. The city's um, third party auditor has found each one of these RFPs to be generally eligible for the grant interim rules. Final approval and review will be performed by the Neighborhood Services staff to ascertain the activities need and justification, cost re reasonableness and effectiveness, management and implementation, agency experience and performance, and application completeness. Staff will provide its funding recommendations to City Council at a future meeting. So with that, um, Ter uh, Terry's behind us. So I think we're going to get uh, a five-minute presentation from each group. Okay, so each group knows when to come up or we need to call them? I, I can introduce. Okay, we'll do it from here. Okay, very good. We're ready to go. Thank you. Uh, your first presentation this evening will be from the Boys and Girls Club of Central Florida. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good to see you I'm again. fantastic. Uh, my name is Erin Harvey, for those who don't know me. I'm the development officer supporting the Brevard County Clubs for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Central Florida. And I'm here specifically for our Titusville Club. With me, I have our president and CEO, Gary Kane, Betsy Owens, who is our vice president of marketing and um, community relations. I have Jack Masson, who is the chairman of our Brevard County Board, and Jeremy Jones, who is our newly hired service director for our Titusville branch. I want to thank you for the opportunity for us to be here and make the case for the funding for these special services that we're requesting. Um, these services will include academic success coaches and special focus with a special focus on increasing the reading skills of our club members and trauma informed care counselors to support the profound emotional needs of the children we serve. Our new club is located in the historic Carter House in the heart of the city's South Street target area. According to the Opportunity Atlas, a database maintained by the U.S. Census Bureau and Harvard University, the Census Tract, where this club is located, suffers from the lowest possible level of economic mobility. Adults who are raised in this neighborhood rank at the first percentile for household income and the 98th percentile for incarceration nationwide. This club is precisely where it needs to be, and we are grateful to the visionary leadership of many people in this room who de whose determination and generosity have made this possible. Layered on top of the challenges facing children and families in this sp specific neighborhood, we have hardships brought about with the COVID-19 pandemic. It's well documented that the pandemic disproportionately affected the children we serve. Specifically, we know that on average, low-income Black and Hispanic students who comprise the majority of our Brevard County clubs have experienced more than a year of learning loss since the start of the pandemic. On the topic of trauma and mental health, we know that the pandemic has been an incubator for childhood trauma as measured by adverse childhood experiences. More than 70% of our club members have endured at least one adverse childhood experience. This includes abuse, neglect, divorce, substance abuse, or incarceration of a family member. We know that children have unresolved trauma and are unable to focus in school and struggle with maintaining passing grades. With access to safe places, school, and our clubs being limited during the pandemic, our club members have experienced a perfect storm of academic decline and emotional uncertainty. The proposal before you this evening <clears throat> is to fund two targeted programs at our new Titusville Club. 
a trauma-informed care specialist to work directly with club members, and an academic success coach to tutor children individually and to partner with our program staff to create a literacy-rich environment in the club. We expect to serve a minimum of 40 children each month through these programs. Specifically, the literacy specialist will implement study recommendations provided by Dr. Rosemary Taylor, whom our organization hired to design a literacy program appropriate for, for our clubs and the children we serve. Dr. Taylor is one of the foremost experts in childhood literacy in the country, and her report provides a blueprint for how to create a colorful culture of colorful literacy in our clubs. Dr. Taylor's recommendations include daily tactics for reading, to, with, and by the children, and for incorporating academic language and literacy into everything we do at our clubs, from art to physical education. We will use our established benchmarks, including testing, and monitoring student report cards to chart the progress we make by this program. Our proposal funding is for 10 hours of academic success coaching per week during the school year. The trauma-informed care specials will work directly with the club members, also 10 hours per week, but throughout the school year and including the summer to help these kids process and heal. The therapist will meet individually with children to help them learn to self-regulate their emotions and behaviors. The therapist will also help to train our club program staff in communicating with the children who have experienced trauma. Working together to prepare club members for success in school and in life. Improvements in social emotional well-being will be demonstrated by pre and post tests. There's amazing things happening here in Titusville and the council deserves a great deal of thanks for that. We at the Boys and Girls Club feel privileged to be partners in a county that ranks second in the country for economic growth. Every child growing up in Titusville need only to look skyward from their front yards every, every other week or so and envision what is possible. What our proposal focuses on is making sure every child, including the most vulnerable children growing up in the South Street Target area, has the emotional academic foundations to be able to take advantage of this new world of opportunity. We look forward to partnering with the city through this grant to close the opportunity grant gap for the children who need us the most. We're happy to answer any questions you have. You probably threw it in there somewhere, but how do you, and, and this is coming from a guy who's 35 years uh, in, in education, um, how do you select those who will be in the program? How, how do you target the uh, kids who need the program? And well, how do you find them? How do you get approval for them to be in the program? Well, we currently work with, um, Jeremy has been working with the schools trying to get referrals, and then the, he'll also be canvassing the neighborhood. We'll specifically be targeting the direct neighborhood that's there, but also talking with the schools about um, making referrals for kids that need us. Okay, good. So school, that's a good idea. Schools will refer children to you, and then I'm assuming you'll work through the parents with the permission, et cetera. Correct. There okay, is. very good, very good. Uh, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to add, uh, last year I talked to the principal at Coquina. Um, she was telling me there were about 50 kids between her and Apollo Elementary School that were problem kids. And by problem kids, I don't mean that they were behavior problems, but they needed academic support. They needed, they needed food. They needed clothing. They needed, they needed support. And those 50 kids came from that target area. And so that was one of the reasons for selecting the Carter House to house a Boys and Girls Club, because they are busing the kids to Apollo and to Coquina. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you, and I'm going to ask you because I know the answer, but <laughs> I'll ask you. I think I know the answer, I should say. Um, my understanding is that prior to the pandemic, the Kids and Boys and Girls Club actually read at a higher level than their peers. For the, for the schools that we support, yes, that correct. is correct. Do you remember what the stats are? Um, <laughs> I'm not good with numbers, exact numbers, <laughs> but I know like, for example, our Cocoa area, a lot of the schools that feed into that, um, maybe 35% of the kids are actually on reading level, where in our clubs, it was more like 90 to 100% of our kids were, were at grade level. Very good. Good? Yeah. Member Robinson. Yes, I, uh, I'm uh, 
Hello. I have a little bit of experience with boys and boys and girls club, and uh, I know the difference that when uh, one was started up in Melbourne, I was in, uh, involved with that. But my question is, is that I know that it's a prime location. I believe that at where it, uh, where the Boys and Girls Club is located. At the same time, I know that there's children that are out of that local area. Is there, could you explain the, any uh, means that are going to be made, uh, put forward to get children that are with, not within that local area over to participate in the activities? We currently do not have a bus system. Um, our other two clubs operate if the children can get there. Um, it doesn't matter where they come from, whether their parents bring them. I know we do work closely with a school in um, Coco, Emma Jewell, that, ch that charters a bus to bring their kids to us. So if there's opportunities like that and they're outside of the immediate area where it's not easy for them to get to, we can certainly explore that. Okay. Thank you. Member Gordon. Yeah, I just want to say thank you because, you know, without education, the kids just don't, don't have a chance at all. And with COVID um, going on, we already had a problem before COVID. And then when this happened, you know, two thirds of the meals that a child gets is in school. And to have an additional avenue for them to um, be successful, I mean, you, you just, you can't pay for that for sure. But I'm happy that we have some funds that we can give you and uh, hopefully um, you're gonna be very successful with that. Um, I'm with, um, uh, yeah, I was going to call you the Reb. Um, you know, you can't, you would want to serve as many kids as possible, but you just really can't. Um, so you just have to focus on who you, you can get. And, you know, the, the challenge you do have is how kids get to that location in order for them to get served. So I hope that we can do even more than what we're doing right now, but I appreciate the application and appreciate what you all are doing. It is no small task right. when it comes down to the kids who are, are in need. And if we don't help them now, then they end up in places that we don't want them to be. Yeah. So um, we're, we're very appreciative of what you're Thank asking you. for. Sure. Thank you. And I think that's everybody. No guys from Mary Nelson, are you back? I'm back. I'm back. Sorry, guys. Um, I was just going to point out, I think the end goal is to have 80 members at the house. Um, somebody offered them a drum set. <laughs> somebody offered what? Offered the club a drum set. Wayne Rogers. Um, oh, I think everybody politely turned him down. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, yes, I, I think the council in general would like to thank you for your efforts. I. I know what my background and what's important to me, uh, working with kids, I've always said it's like breathing air to me. When I stop doing that, I'm done. So I definitely plan on uh, getting some time over there when things get started and settle in and say, let's go volunteer. So Great. thank you very much for what you're doing and your proposal, and we'll go from there. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation this evening will be from Grow. Good evening. Good evening. I printed a copy. Thank you. I can never do this. Again, good e good evening. My name is Jacqueline Idolette Reason. I am the Managing Director of Programs for Grow Nonprofit Services Corporation. We're located, the main administrative office is located in the South Street Target area. However, all of our client and customer services programs and activities take place at the Gibson Community Center. Our grant proposal request is for $75,000 and the request, the funds would be used in this manner. We would. Bring, we would spend eight to $12,000 to help bring in two part-time program staff. 
we would spend thirty to thirty eight thousand two hundred and ninety four dollars to provide household support services for 10 to 35 households in the target area of the city of Titusville. And we would include uh, in the household income, businesses and self-employment. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that a little bit later in the presentation. We would also spend $750 to help subsidize our annual audit and management review by a CPA firm. And then we anticipate carrying over approximately $24,000 to another year to continue providing additional services unless there's a demand high enough to spend the money in the, for, in the current year. On the next page, we are... Um, our category that we have chosen to seek funding under is providing aid in the public health and, eco and economic impact. So uh, there's a little diagram there that talks about the five determinants of, uh, social, of social determinants of health. One is economic stability. We have education assistance and quality, healthcare assistance and quality, neighborhood and built environments social and community context. Our funding goals under aid in, pu in public health and economic impact would be to provide computer <coughs> skills training and development and user support under a subcategory of health care IT. So under healthcare IT, this allows people to come in and utilize the computers with support to be able to set up um, accounts to access their health care records, to be able to keep track of their children's health care records, immunization shots, things of that nature, be able to print them for school, um, to be able to have virtual health care visits, to be able to um, apply for help for different types of programs. Now, there's a lot of I'm sorry, I have something in my eye I've been trying to get out, I'm sorry. But there's a lot of help that's going on in the community where people can go and get help with light bills, electric bills, things of that nature. So in order to do that, usually you have to apply. So there's applications that's online for that. So what we're looking to do is bring people into the, what we call our workplace lab, allow them to use a computer, but we would have a program person there to help teach them how to go through that process, how to set up these portals, and how to manage their health care, how to manage employment applications, job applications, how to look for school records, keep up with what's going on with their children's school, those types of activities under health care um, IT and computer training skills. We would um, implement work-based training opportunities for young people and for young adults. When we talk about work-based training, we're talking ages 12, middle school, up through age 24. We're very much interested in the middle school age because they're young enough where they can start to learn job skills but they're not old enough for us to have to compete with McDonald's, Burger King, <clears throat> for them to employ. So we can maintain their attention for a while to teach them work-based skills, to teach them work readiness, and to give them job training and work experience there through our programs, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. We also would like to, um, we also currently provide volunteer and um, participant incentives through funding that we're bringing in through services, however, a portion of this funding that we're asking for would allow us to do more of that. So we would be able to expand on that particular program. We are looking to be a little bit innovative, so we've included tokens um, for eligible business pur purchases of essential non-food items and services that support medical and physical wellness. This is a little bit after the farmer's market program that's going on in Titusville, which is very, very, very successful. I go to that every other week. I love it. I look forward to it. And I think it was very innovative. But one of the things that I have noticed while I'm out there is that there's very little representation of businesses of color, especially black business. So a lot of what I do over at the Gibson Center really targets and focuses on individuals that are involved in business, entrepreneurship, self-employment. So with this token program, we have uh, one thing we've done over there is set up a gift shop. 
So a lot of people may already know that the Gifford, that the Gibson Center um, facilitates events on the weekends. So the gift shop is a great enhancement for the celebrations that's going on, but it also provides a platform for many of the people that we work with that's operating businesses to actually have their um, products in there and to be sold to other people that are coming for those celebrations. So with the token program, it was focused specifically on items such as um, your shampoos, your body care, your um, <clears throat> anything that has to do with caring for yourself. You, you could be personal services. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm a little nervous. I'm sorry, it's been a while. Um, and to respond to negative economic impacts, of the COVID, which is training and applied learning, technical assistance workshops, e-learning classes, economic development and employment projects. So if we are awarded grant funds. We will help supplement revenue currently generated from various program freezes and services. Increase and operate. We will increase our operating hours. Now we're only there two hours, two days a week for 13 hours, and we would like to increase to four days, 24 to 32 hours per week. We have very few hours because we only have one person who really is full time and that's me, but I volunteer most of that time and I really do need help. I'm just, oh, just outside of my capacity and we have done a lot of work getting programs in place, having everything set up. But at this point, in order for me to actually have people participating in the program on a regular basis, we need to be there and I need help. So um, <clears throat> staff would definitely be a, a, a part of this. We want to improve participation in programs and provide a means to implement sliding scale fees. So again, we're bringing in some revenue. However, people have to have the means to pay for it in order to participate. And the director can finally focus on leadership responsibilities and program success. Our current revenue over the last year, we generated $30,000, and that came from membership join fees, program service fees, subscription fees, program activity fees, and we have now put together a sponsorship program for the 21-22 fiscal year. Our organizational experience, we have 20, I have 27 years of working and leading grassroots 501c3 organizations, and through, throughout those years, I've been required to um, coordinate eligibility determinations for various government contracts and grants, including program rep reporting, government accounting, based upon local, state, and federal requirements. We are prepared to implement our services that we're proposing in a turnkey fashion based upon our st standard program framework, which will make it very easy to implement. This includes a data capture and reporting system, an existing customer base of targeted of the targeted household community. Out, we have a community outreach platform for additional recruitment if necessary through the events that are facilitated at the Gibson Community Center. The average uh, event brings in 80 to 100 people at a time, and we have um, worked with each person that's hosting an event to be able to pass out information about our programs and um, provide, inf you know, collect information, their emails and their um, contact numbers and be able to share events and things of that nature. That has worked out very well. We get lots of inquiries from that. And we also have the Workplace Technology Co-working and Co-Learning Center that we have established. And I think each of you have had the opportunity to come over to the center and take a tour to see how things are set up. So in the, in the, in the workplace co-working and co-learning center, that's where all of the activities that um, we would provide would actually take place. They would, be, they would be centralized and then they would be supervised and they would, uh, the participants would receive support from the program staff that we're looking to bring in with, with getting from point A to point B. It, for whatever objective they're trying to reach. So our current customer base exists of 54 adults that have, a reg that have registered and participated in our program activities. Of these 54, 
54 of them earn income from some type of business or self-employment. Now, the thing that, is, that strikes me with this particular statistic is that most of these businesses I had never heard of, and most of you probably don't know about either. They're invisible in the community. They're working, they're earning money. Most of them are not licensed. They're doing things to survive. They've had to either uh, replace employment or they have barriers to getting the licensing that they need to be able to operate in the public, with the, in the public market. So our programs really heavily target these individuals so that we can bring them in, take them through the processes, through some technical assistance workshops and classes, and help them get what they need so that they can become visible and uh, compete in the, in the public marketplace. We have eight additional adults that are enrolled in our adult continuing education program. We have one youth right now that's enrolled in work-based training, and we have eight senior volunteers that are enrolled in our Seniors on the Move program. All of these people provide some of the support that I need in order to be able to continue functioning out at the Gibson Community Center. All of those think, tasks that they perform are support in nature. There are no one, there's no one that's able to bring skills to the table to be able to help move the organization forward. So we're going day by day, day by day, and they're filling in where they can. So our strategy is to provide applied learning activities and projects. And in summary, they would be technical assistance workshops. We would continue our Gibson neighborhood marketplace. We have the gift shop, which we just talked about. We've just partnered up with a young lady who will be implementing a culinary education and training program at the Gibson Center. She will be the uh, teacher and coordinator for that program. We have a snack bar and we also have a children's play area for, for adults who would come and utilize the workplace and they need care for their toddlers. So we've talked a lot, of, we've talked a lot about the younger kids that need academic support and things of that nature, but there's still a gap in service for people who work, need to work when they're from home, whether they wanna to go to school and they have young children and they have babies, infants, crawlers, and they're not able to go to daycare because they're on a waiting list or they just can't afford to pay the fees or they prefer for them not to go to daycare, but they do, I'm sorry, they do wanna work, but they need some sort of help. So we have a children's playroom in which some of the seniors will come and just monitor the children while they play. It is not a licensed daycare center. It is simply a room that's right there in the center where the parents are, and we have people that are there monitoring them while they play. Okay, we also have a few family activities, which is volunteering. We have, uh, we have a couple of people from the community that's operating exercise classes, a cultural and fine arts program, again, computer and technology skills development, and the culinary instructor will also do <coughs> cooking classes. So these are some positive family activities that can take place and that we can offer um, some sponsorships for families and household members to participate in. And the support services outcomes that we're looking to um, have our nationally recognized UCF training certificates and up to 96 CEUs for adults that participate in our adult continuing education program. We are partnering up with UCF on these training uh, programs. They are approved through, through their continuing education division. A local training credential, comp competency skills credentials, a verifiable work experience reference to support job uh, search, a professional reference to support career advancement, employment, and employment and an increase in household income, a, a decreased level of stress, uh, improved work, learn, and life balance, an increase, an increase in confidence and self-esteem, and increased physical and social activities among members of the household. And with that, looks like you're on your last page, but uh, <coughs> the one thing is that, that I feel like there's not gonna be anything overlooked because you just remind me of everything because I think you said everybody's been over there for the tour. I did the tour. I even remember where the play area was when you were mm -hmm. talking about it. Yes. So with that, um, unless there's any questions, 
Member <clears throat> Robinson. Yes, I have a question. The uh, the seventy five thousand dollars that you are requesting, as I look through this, what is it specifically targeting? It's specifically tar well. It's I see that you have uh, eight to twelve thousand dollars for uh, two new salary members. Yes. Of staff members. Yes. But I don't see uh, in the layout what the other dollars are targeted for. They're targeting the training programs, the adult continuing education training programs, mm -hmm. incentives for the work based training and work experience programs. Mm -hmm. It's also for sponsorships for, in, for uh, household members who would like to participate in some of the exercise classes, foreign, fine arts programs, and other activities that make go. But you don't have a breakdown for that? No, because <clears throat> each family is going to be different. It depends upon what's going on to, you know, what the family needs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a family that may have um, children, like I talked about, a younger child, they need a place to come and work, and they need monitoring for that child for a minute. They may need child monitoring, and that parent may need some help with the tuition to take the classes, whereas there may just there may be another household that doesn't have children but they may be stressed because they don't have enough finance. So they need more social type activities, things to relieve their stress. So they may just want to participate in maybe one of the uh, dance classes or uh, one of the fine arts programs or social activities. So you, it would be structured based upon the need needs of the family. So there's a menu of things that can be, uh, they can choose from but no family's uh, map may be the same. But you, you have no uh, uh, set cost for activities or set cost <clears throat> for if a family wanted to participate in uh, uh, an exercise class. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a cost for that exercise class? Absolutely. On, on a menu? Yes. I, ha I do have a price list. I just knew that we had a certain amount of time and there was only a certain amount of information okay, and I, I could just bring, but I do Dr. have, so, so there are I can set prices. See, yes. see how that lays out because right now it's, uh, you're asking for an amount and I don't see how that amount is going to be allocated or used in the process. Okay, so in, so in, the, in the budget it's set up for <laughs> A maximum of thirty thousand dollars. It's for ten households at three thousand each. However, I went high for the household, so that's why the range is ten to thirty-five households, because it could be anywhere from a thousand to thirty-five hundred. Per, I'm sorry, three thousand per household, depending upon how many people are in the household. So it could be a household of one. It could be a household of four depending upon the needs. But uh, still, I, I understand that I'm still not giving, how you how are you going to govern what that family is going to need or the cost of the services to that family? Well, I have a price list to answer your question, which I can share with okay. no problem. That's, I that's, can definitely send that to you, no problem. Okay, <clears throat> okay. thank you very much. All right. thank you. Appreciate it. And the longer we get, the closer we get to the end of this time frame, the more I'm going to try to stay around five to ten minutes. Okay, go ahead. Our next presentation this evening is uh, Catholic Charities of Central Florida. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I'm Rosa Reich. I'm the lead case manager for Catholic Charities Catholic of Charities. Central Florida here in Brevard County. And I brought along a couple of my team members, uh, Jennifer Brandon and Jose Hernandez. And uh, what we're requesting is we are requesting for $25,300. We're going to have a part-time navigator. We know that there's a lot of needs here in Brevard County and especially here up in Titusville. So the role of the navigator is to assist persons with applying for mainstream services such as food stamps, Medicaid, uh, our Florida, that's a very complicated application. Even the county application for rent assistance can be complicated. So we'll be providing those services. We're not requesting any funding for rent or utilities. We already work through the Brevard Homeless Coalition to have funding to pay rent and utilities. So our goal is as the residents of Tysville call us up, need assistance, we will assess their needs, 
fit them into the appropriate program. If they qualify for our programs, that will be the first priority, local programs. If they don't qualify because they are federal grants that we work with, then we'll look at other grants, such as the our Florida or county or anything else. We will help them prepare the applications, scan the documents, make sure they get emailed, because a lot of them have, um, especially those in need, sometimes do not have access to technology. Libraries sometimes are not available at the hours that they need. Um, they use a friend's printer or copier, doesn't work out. So we are going to be doing a, a lot of the work for them and do that kind of assessment. The other position uh, we're going to, um, it's not to, going to be a new position, but it will be to augment what Jose is going to be doing. He's going to be primarily focused up here in the northern end of the county. We are active members of the Brevard Homeless Coalition. In the last two years, I have chaired the Homeless uh, a coordinated assessment committee where we match persons who are homeless with agencies to get them housed. So we are active members in coordinated entry system. It has kind of changed uh, processes as of two weeks ago. But Jose will work with others here in Titusville, faith-based communities, um, North Brock Charity Sharing Center, anybody who's available. We'll connect with the unhoused and get them entered into the system and, get, and, and work with the BHC, the Brevard Homeless Coalition, to get them matched with an appropriate agency to get them off the streets and into permanent housing. So that is basically going to be our goal. We, as an agency, we do cover the whole county. We do have offices in different locations. We have entered an agreement with Community of Hope, and we'll be sharing their office space at the Harry T. Moore Social Services Center. Our main office in Brevard County is just a few miles down the road at uh, Blessed Sacrament Catholic Church in Port St. John. So we will be working both locations. Some of your Titusville residents may be working down in Melbourne. We also have some church locations we can use. When we meet with somebody, we say, where are you working, where do you live? And we match them to our location that's closest and most convenient so they don't miss a lot of work time, especially for the, the working families. So um, as I said, we, we do cover the whole county. Uh, we do not um, discriminate in any way, shape, or form. We do have the name Catholic Charities, but Catholic means universal, and that's what we are. We serve everybody who comes to us in need. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, you have a very specific number down there, so you have a very specific need. Yes, sir. Meaning that it, there's not a vagueness to it. You are, this is what we need, and this is what we're going to do with it. Right. We are a very long-established company, so uh, as an agency, we cover nine counties, so uh, we are um, an agency under the Diocese of Central Florida, so we have pay skills already and everything else in place. Our current navigate, we do have a person in the navigation part. She came to us through a grant through Career Source, a COVID grant. Her grant funding will end soon. So this is where our hope, where this navigation, she will continue to work. She is a resident of Titusville, so she would love to be, not have to commute even down to Port St. John. And she's very well versed with your city, has been a long-term resident. So we're hoping to keep her employed. And, uh, and she knows, you know, we asked her before we did this application, would she be interested if we got this funding? And she said, absolutely. She's already well-trained in helping people with Medicaid, food stamps, and other things. So it's just a matter of rollover. Very good. I see no questions. Thank you very much. Certainly. I would say as we move into the next two, and these seem to be the bigger of the five, and I'll speak for myself and, and you guys can nod or not, um, I, I like an overview of what you are in case we don't know, but I don't need all the specs of everything you do and have ever done. But I do need to know what you are looking for the requested money for. And the more specific you are, the better. Oh, close. All right. Thank you. All right, our next uh, presentation this evening is from the Christian Life Center Academy. Good evening. Good evening. I am Patricia Hickman Barber. I am the administrator slash manager, teacher at the Life Center Academy, which is located at 835 Sycamore Street. Um, we are also the managers of the community hours and times at the Gibson Community Youth Gym. So we are currently seeking funding. As we've discussed, um, of course, we're living in a time when our community is experiencing serious gaps with our youth due to COVID. Um, this is the first year that I've had um, numerous kids in the school that are suffering with 
not just academic uh, gaps, but also social gaps, social anxiety. Um, Five-year-olds that uh, don't speak outside of the home. Um, those are types of things that we are dealing with. So in an effort to kind of close the gap, not just for the students at the academy, but for all students in the community, because the community hours, of, of course, are for all students. Um, we are looking to expand our current programs. We currently have many programs going on at the Gibson Community Center. Of course, most of them were halted due to COVID, but we're currently getting them back going and started. Prior to COVID, we averaged about 100, 125 children on property outside of the school um, per day. Um, as we are going back in, getting things going, starting up again, we're averaging about 100, 125 per week, and it's growing daily. Um, we uh, have s several mentoring programs. We have um, a partnership with uh, the University of Central Florida for children who are taking FLVS courses and trying to um, some are trying to move ahead, some are trying to close the achievement gap, some are missing credits. Um, it is open to all students. Um, and it is currently we have two mentors, two paid mentors that come in and help those children two days a week after school with their FLVS courses upon completion of the courses. Um, last year we gave 13, we had 13 children in the program. All 13 received a computer to keep um, as their own for finishing the program as their incentive. Their incentive. We also have um, a basketball program that's currently going on that um, includes a tutoring piece. In order to be in the program, the children have to have a certain GPA. If they do not, they are not taken out of the basketball program, but during their practice time, they uh, must be tutored on whatever subject they are having difficulties with, which also ties into our after school program where we are um, tutoring children, trying to find different ways to um, fill the achievement gaps without doing what they've been doing all day at school. So things like cooking, things like playing games, things like sports, things that are different, but yet you can pull in an educational piece to help close the achievement gap. We currently use pre and post tests for the children that come on a regular basis to gauge whether or not they're making gains. For children who actually attend the academy, of course, we track them due to standardized test scores. Um, community children are, are given a pre and post test. We also currently have within our after school program a garden. Uh, once again, we are trying to get that back up and going. It was going really well. Prior to COVID, we were eating out of the, we were actually eating out of the garden. Um, the children were getting to experience the foods and things that they were growing. Uh, we also have a summer program that we are looking to help with funding. It is a um, boys and girls. We hire two teachers that come in two hours in the morning they work with the children on whatever they're struggling in, and then the rest of the day is spent with field trips, summer camp type activities, those things. So we have a lot of things going on on property. But of course, free programs aren't really free. They take money, they take funding. And although we don't charge the children, the funding for these programs have to come from somewhere. So we are hoping to partner with the city of Titusville to keep these programs going, to extend them, to make them bigger, larger, because as you know, the gap now is larger than it was. Thank you. Questions? I see none. Thank you very much. No questions. no questions. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. All right. Uh, next, we have North of Arch Charity Sharing Center. We have uh, four applications from their agency. So we'll start with the self sufficiency training and coaching program, and then the direct financial assistance, and then um, the after school programs at the Boys and Girls Club. So these four, are these four different evaluations of uh, applicant? Yes, sir. So even though they're under North Brevard Charities Sharing Center, they're separate? Yes, sir. 
Okay, so in reality, we have four more applications. Okay, that was a little four more, yeah, on the paper. program. Thank you. It'll be it'll be less than five minutes. No, and I'm promise. not worried about the time. I'm just when I look at this, I see one hundred eighty-eight thousand one hundred forty-seven dollars. Yes. And now it looks like they're. I'm not quite even sure why they're all together if they're separate applications. So no, I don't, you can tell we are good with time. So. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Brian Walton, and uh, since April, I've had the privilege of serving as Executive Director of North Brevard Charities. Um, it's been a great time and uh, serving a wonderful organization that's been a part of this community for a very long time. Um, I'm here tonight because of a little three-year-old boy named Devin that I met a few months ago in the alley behind our store. Uh, Devin showed up with his mom. He and his mom were there with no home, no car, no money, no job, no friends, no family, and uh, very little hope and a questionable future. Uh, we were able to help Devin and his mom. Uh, we are still helping them. In fact, they were at the office today. Uh, today they have housing, she has a job, and he has reliable childcare for himself. But along the way, what I experienced very clearly with Devin and his mom is that because because his mom herself was a product of childhood poverty, um, they needed a lot of assistance that money alone just can't provide. Uh, that, that, that just giving, paying a, paying a utility bill alone wasn't going to solve their problems. Problem is that Devin's mom, because of her upbringing and her experience, she really lacked um, even the basic beliefs in herself. Uh, she lacked the ability to dream dreams. She lacked the ability to problem solve, uh, basic money management abilities. Uh, she didn't really have any parenting strategies, even an understanding of nutrition for her son. Uh, she didn't really uh, have those things, basic things that most of us in this room take for granted and learned as we were growing up in life. And the thing about Devin is, is that he's actually only one of 4,941 children here in North Brevard who live below the poverty line and 18,236 kids in all of Brevard County who are growing up in poverty. And so for those kids, for those kids their futures are filled with challenges and question marks. Um, and again, they have problems that just simply paying a utility bill isn't necessarily going to solve. Uh, they need someone to come alongside them and to invest in them and to help them develop some new life skills and to develop some self-sufficiency in their lives. And that's why we uh, are wanting to launch something called Genomai. And I did bring pages for And I think this will help Mr. Mayor a little bit. Um, I tried to present it in just a one-page summary. Um, so I, I'm sure that the staff viewed the applications as four separate things. In our mind's eye, they are really all kind of, it's one program with four components. All could be individually funded, and I recognize that you've got some wonderful opportunities that have been put for, before you tonight, tough choices, and you know we love these agencies too. So we gave you the opportunity to say yes and no as, uh, as you saw fit and what you believed would be best for our community. So genomai is the Greek word. It means to be or to become. And the concept is, is that we would like to create some programming that would help some individuals to have the best opportunity to become the best version of themselves. So it's a life enrichment and self-sufficiency training program with these four components. And I'm going to mention them in the order of priority that we see them as from our perspective. So the first is a self-sufficiency training program program that we would do live training events at the Harry T. Moore Center. Uh, these events would be based very much similar to a program called ROS that is done in housing authorities across the country. Uh, topics would be based on the social determinants of health uh, as defined by the U.S. Department of Health. Uh, our goal would be to do one a week for 30 months. Uh, that would be 12 people per week that we would be targeting, and that turns out to be a lot of people over time. Topics on relationships 
relationships, money management, job training, education issues, uh, nutrition, family management, really any host of things as the social determinants are pretty broad. We'd love to live stream those events, make them available to those who can't be there, record them and have them available on demand. Second part of the program is an after school program in partnership with our friends at the Boys and Girls Club. And I want to be clear, we're not doing the after school program. Why would we when we have such amazing partners? Um, a lot of resources have been put into the facility at 126 Granis. We're providing that facility. Uh, we've spent about $300,000 as a community renovating that building so far. Um, North Brevard Charities has put in about 50% of that. Um, so we put in a little resources there because as wanting to be great partners, we're providing that facility free of charge to the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, but, you know, I had an estimate yesterday for the insurance alone is $4,000 a year. And so we put some resources in there to invest in that South Street target community. Uh, number three is direct financial assistance that we wanted to provide mortgage assistance, rent assistance and utilities. And if staff... Uh, saw fit and it was allowable under the rules, we would love to link that back to the self-sufficiency training uh, to, to do some sort of copacetic things there um, that we assist people and also encourage them to attend the self-sufficiency uh, workshops. And then fourth, uh, short-term emergency shelter. Uh, we have uh, one facility in particular that we feel is underutilized and uh, we would like to provide it as a two-bedroom facility, four beds, Again, working out the final rules with staff on exactly how to use that. Um, we also have another facility that's a little bit larger that we could use, but having short-term emergency housing in the community is a, is a real challenge. And again, we'd love to link that back to the self-sufficiency training programs. That's it. First of all, we're very well laid out, um, easily seen, easily deciphered where you're going with that. Um, and, and that the only confusing factor to me was there was one number at the top and then some other numbers. So we've got that figured out. Uh, Member Robinson. Hello, sir. <laughs> yes, you knew you wasn't going. I'm very. I was one of the first individuals to bring the Ross program to uh, the Highland program in Vivard County. It is a very good program, and better in your program after that. I commend that thought, and uh, uh, I hope you success with that. We'd love to have some consulting on that as well, sir. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Vice Mayor. From somebody consulting from somebody who's retired. <laughs> Brian, I do have a question for you and, and for Mr. Robinson. Um, you're talking about self-sufficiency training, and usually when you have meetings after hours, uh, people are, nobody, nobody seems to break down the door to get into those meetings. Absolutely, yes. So how do you, how do you get the people there? I mean, yeah. seriously, I'm asking both of you guys. So, so we, we, put some, we put some concepts into our application of things we had in mind, and, and I heard some of it mentioned by uh, one of the other agencies earlier. You know, some incentive programs, like we're talking about maybe even incentives at our thrift store, that if people participate in the program, we can provide some coupons and things at the store for them yeah. to be able to, to be there. Again, that's where I kind of I wanted to experiment with the, the rent and utility assistance again if that was allowable under the rules like could we tie some of that to self-sufficiency um you know as i think all of you know north Brevard charities have been here a long time and my predecessor did an amazing job and uh you know we're continuing to build on the things that were done there but in one of my first conversations with him he he shared with me that you know what we really needed to get better at was just figuring out how to help people grow beyond where they are so so this is, um, it, you know, it's uncharted water, and I think that is going to be the hardest thing yeah. is to get people there. Um, and, because and I think, I think the people need the help. I think that it would help them out. But usually, when you say to somebody you need help, it's sort of like not me. Yeah. So that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in addition to that, you can tie it into the services rendered. Yes. And make it, uh, if you want services and you need the help, you pull it all together and you utilize the individuals that are in your programs already. And 
and make it available. So, yes, you can use some incentivizing, uh, and sometimes that Couple is by, you know, saying if you want this, what you have to do. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you for the presentation and the clarity. Uh, City Manager. Yes, sir. We're on to uh, 4F, which is a presentation by Attorney Ken Artman, Artin. Uh, he'll present general information regarding community development districts and no actions required on this one. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Now, they said this was really simple to run. They always do. No. <laughs> Yeah, it works. Great. Okay. My name is Ken Artin. I'm with the law firm of Bryant Miller Olive. You typically see Rhonda Von Collins up here. She's my partner. Um, I work with a number of our clients with respect to community development districts, CDDs. It is probably the most popular uh, special district type financing structure um, used in any major residential commercial development in the state of Florida at this point in time. Um, what we're going to do, what is a CDD, what they can do, what they can't do, benefits to city, benefits to developers, and how residents are protected. That's what I plan to um, cover today. It, all this information is going to be in the slides. I know we're a little late in the uh, program, so if I talk a little fast, fear not, it's, it's in the slides and you can uh, ask, ask questions as, as we go. As I mentioned, this is a uh, unit of special purpose government, meaning the developer is actually causing a, a governmental unit to be created and with jurisdiction over his land. The, and it, it's not, there's no extraterritorial powers with that, uh, meaning they're not going to be levying special assessments on land that is not outside of the CDD. The Florida legislature put chapter 190 on the books uh, so there was a uniform method of these special districts created throughout the state. And um, there's an excess, I believe, of last count, about 2,500 CDDs that have been used by various developers um, around the state. Uh, community development district is, if it's under 2,500 acres, it's created locally. If it's above 2,500 acres, you go to the um, state cabinet for uh, the petitions filed with the state cabinet and they approve the establishment and the um, cdd is governed by a five member board of um, supervisors all right what can they do and basically it is a financing tool they finance horizontal public infrastructure and that's a key point this is public infrastructure the members of the general public. So roads, water, sewer, stormwater, these are all what you'd think of as the public infrastructure part of a, um, a residential or commercial development. If you see gates go up um, on a residential development, um, and you would, one of the things that um, would no longer be financed are the roads. Anything beyond that gate that is not public access anymore would not be financeable. So think of a CDD financing public infrastructure um, uh, in that regard. And again, it's most everything that's horizontal, roads, streets, um, lighting, parks. Once a developer is building vertical homes, buildings, that's what he's got to finance. Those are private improvements. And um, we're truly focusing on the public nature um, of the improvements. And um, with respect, I don't, I'm not quite sure with the, with the city's programs of um, uh, water and sewer. If a CDD puts in water and sewer pipes, um, but the city requires, a, like when a developer does it, that those pipes and improvements have to be dedicated to the city, that's absolutely uh, permitted and um, something that a CDD doesn't override. So anything that is in the city's development code um, is not overridden by Chapter 190. And then um, one of the uh, nice features of CDDs is their perpetual existence. 
Um, and so the public infrastructure that they retain and own can be maintained by that. And one of the big things there is stormwater ponds. Um, and the uh, state water management districts really um, appreciate CDDs in that regard because maintaining stormwater ponds and how they work and function is very, very important to them. And one of the other more important features of a CDD is they can levy non ad valorem special assessments, meaning if they're financing all of these public improvements, how do they get paid? They get paid by levying special assessments on the land within their jurisdiction. Um, and basically, they use those special assessments to secure bonds that are issued by the CDD that finance those public, in, uh, public improvements. Important slide, what can't they do, all right? They have no power to write their own comprehensive plan. They can't develop their own development code. Everything with respect to how a residential development is developed is still governed the way it is right now. County, city requirements, um, they just are, if you really truly get down to it, all it is is a financing mechanism. Um, the, the debt of a CDD, I mentioned that they issue bonds to finance these appro um, improvements, they are not a debt of the city or the county. It remains a debt of the CDD, very recognized uh, financing mechanism. There's a very uh, liquid market um, in CDDs, um, and, and so they are not put on your balance sheet. They don't affect your debt limits. They don't, the assessments don't affect your millage rates. Um, and they're, they're independent in all of those regards. Reporting requirements. This is, I'm gonna spend just a little time here, but this is important because remember, the developer's causing a government to be created. So everything that is governmental that you are burdened by, sunshine laws, open records, advertising, public bidding, a CDD has to comply with. So um, with the benefits of being able to finance all those public improvements come the burdens of dealing with all of the government superstructure that you are used to uh, day to day is sitting on the city commission. Uh, there's a, a number of um, uh, reports that they have to file with, with the state, but most importantly, in the conduct of the meetings, they have to prepare agendas, they have to publish minutes, um, and uh, every year there's an audit done uh, on the CDD uh, that is available to the, to the public. Why does a developer want to uh, create a CDD on its land? Some of the benefits that you can imagine, low cost of financing. The bonds that the, the district issues are actually tax exempt bonds. In fact, they benefit from the same uh, cost of financing that the city does when you borrow money. Uh, tax exempt debt means the interest held by, or the interest received by the bondholders is not included in their federal income tax. So if they don't have to pay tax on that, they can offer a lower interest rate. So um, it is a lower cost of financing than going to the local bank and doing uh, a development loan with respect to those improvements. It's a government, so it's going to be exempt from sales tax on the cost of construction and materials that are purchased. It's non-recourse. Um, special assessments are not an obligation of the landowner. What a special assessment is, it's a lien against the land. If the person that owns that land doesn't pay its special assessments, they lose it. Um, so it's uh, basically the, the county goes through the sale of tax certificates and eventually that landowner could possibly lose its land if he doesn't pay his taxes. And, and that's a, a key point to the security in the financial markets when they go to decide to buy um, uh, CDD bonds is that fact that the assessments are collected on the tax bill and all the remedies that a county tax collector has are available to them to secure their bond issue. The um, CDD also has the benefit of being able to finance offsite improvements. So say a city's development order says you need left turning lanes. Well, that, th those turning lanes into the CDD are outside <coughs> of the developer's land. They're on either county or state roads. 
but those improvements can be financed through the CDD. There's no assessments on those roads um, when they're financed, but the cost of those improvements, traffic signalization into the district, all of those offsites are um, capable, if it's in the development order, um, of being financed through the CDD. And one of the, the points I touched on already is the bottom bullet here. It's a strong collection method for operating and maintaining operations and maintenance of the assessments. Unlike an HOA who just mails a bill to the homeowners and basically the homeowner can decide to pay or not pay, but the HOA basically has to decide how they're going to um, enforce the remedies. The special assessments on C from CDDs are collected on the tax bill. It's a very secure method of collection. They use the uniform method of collection. And um, what that means is the bondholders uh, know that, again, as I mentioned, if a landowner doesn't pay his um, uh, tax bill, then there's a built-in remedy through the sale of tax certificates um, to make sure that they are repaid uh, their investment in the CDD bond. So it's, it's a very, um, it adds a, a, a very high level of security um, to the investors that buy the CDD bonds. Resident, the benefits of the resident. Um, what you will typically find in CDDs is a higher level of amenities uh, because the, they have the lower cost of financing available to them. Um, so you usually see uh, an upgrade to the quality of the amenities in the district. Um, the assessments are disclosed in marketing materials. And I've got, I'll save that one for the last. I have a whole slide on how the residents of a CDD are made aware of the situation and, and thus um, protected. The CDD outlives the developer. Um, eventually, by year um, six through eight, um, at the time when there's like, I believe the number is 250 residents living in the district, the developer starts losing control over the Board of Supervisors. It must be elected by the residents. So in year six, he'll, uh, one member of the five will be elected um, by residents and the other four by the landowners. So if the developer is still controlling most of the unsold lots, his votes will count. But um, and then the next year, two board members have to be elected by the residents. So eventually it'll it transition where three out of the five, and at that point you've lost control. So um, you will have a fully resident board by year 10 of a typical CDD. And at that point in time, um, that board is monitoring the improvements that the CDD is um, owning and has to maintain. Um, and also just um, at that point in time, most of the improvements that were financed on the front end of the development, it's on autopilot. So they're just continually lay, levying the, the debt service special assessments, but they're monitoring the uh, O&M or the operations and maintenance aspects of, of the district. The liability for the assessments are limited to um, the owners of that land. It's, it's not, um, there are no corporate guarantees. Um, and the trade-off there with the investors is the fact that that collection method through the uh, uniform method um, is there and is viewed as very, very secure source of repayment. Meetings are advertised and held in the sunshine. So the residents are very, uh, can be made aware of uh, what's going on in the CDDs. Their, open, their meetings are in the sunshine. They have to be posted just like the city's meetings. Um, and so um, these are important aspects of making sure that everyone is aware of what the CD is, CDD is doing. Benefits of city and county. Um, again, um, it's a stable financing source for new public projects, uh, allows for new offsite infrastructure. We've talked about that with the turning lanes uh, and other types of offsite improvements. Um, there are no burdens on residents outside of the CDD. Again, assessments are only, can only be levied on land within the district boundaries. 
Um, you're increasing the tax base with the, uh, with the additional development. And the, the maintenance issue um, shouldn't be discounted. It, it's very critical that the assets that are being um, uh, maintained by the district, it gives them a very stable source of uh, revenue to pay for that operating uh, and maintenance costs. And this is important for not only improvements like stormwater lakes and ponds and systems that have to be maintained, but if the CDD is used to um, build uh, recreational facilities, parks, uh, amenity centers, swimming pools, that type of stuff. Again, you do need that O&M side of the budget to uh, maintain uh, those facilities. Uh, we've talked about that. Okay, this is, this is critical and important. All right, how does a buyer of a home know they're stepping into or buying a piece of property within the CDDs? And, and these are the steps that a developer must take um, with respect to establishing the CDD. The first one, um, every potential resident has to be provided the brochure explaining how a CD, CDD functions and that annual assessments um, uh, may be uh, levied by that district. There is a recorded notice of establishment that has to go in the property records. And so ev every time a homeowner buys its home, and you know, I'll be honest, uh, when, whenever you buy a home, you get that title, you, title policy and all the restrictions. Does everybody go through all that? It's, it's hard to say. I did it when I bought my house, but I'm a lawyer. Um, but the notice of establishment kicks out with every title report when a homeowner is purchasing it. Um, and the chapter 190 includes specific language that has to go into the Florida standard residential um, home purchase contract. So it's, um, it's spelled out, it's um, the font size um, and where it's gotta be positioned in the contract. So all of these things are designed to inform the public that they are buying into a CDD um, and with respect to you know, the fact that special assessments may be uh, uh, levied by that district. And then the market itself also um, builds in a lot of protections. Um, the, the investment community that was buying CDDs before the financial crisis saw land values go to zero. And so they, you know, some projects were highly leveraged at that time. And so uh, didn't matter what the special assessments were on a piece of property, if the land's worth zero, developers and um, uh, were walking from property left and right. So they learned um, to some degree, um, you know, how to structure and what to buy. And so now um, special assessments and CDD bonds, um, there's, there's two things that go into it. All right, what is the leverage that the investors are looking for? Just how much special assessments can you put on a homeowner before that land becomes over leveraged? All right, so they're looking at it that way. And two, if the, if the market's working correctly, when, uh, when the homeowner comes in and says, all right, what am I going, what are my payments? You know, you're gonna look at your principal and interest payment special assessments are gonna be added to that, taxes, insurance, they'll get a full picture of what they're going to um, be paying for on a monthly or annual basis in, in that regard. So you have the homeowners, if they don't like the level of assessments going into the purchase, they'll go to the development down the street and buy a home that's outside of a CDD. So the market is designed to protect the residents and the investors are protecting themselves by making sure the developer isn't pushing too much of that special assessment onto them. They need to make sure that homes get sell, sold and homes are sold quick enough so they, um, they basically um, have a much more um, secured investment. Now that's about the fastest I've ever done that pr presentation, <laughs> but I'm sure you have questions. Member Robinson. Yes, uh, one of the biggest question, uh, questions that I have, is there a, an end date on? Excellent, excellent question. Yeah, thank you. 
Under Chapter 190, um, debt assessments are limited to 30 principal payments. So what that means is, um, uh, given the first couple of years while everything's under construction, by year 32, 33, all the debt has to be paid off that was issued for that particular improvement. And um, so there's definite term for that, but keep in mind the CDD is perpetual, so if that stormwater pond is gonna last 50, 60 years, that CDD is there, and those assessments, basically uh, what a CDD will do is, all right, what are, what are our, what's our budget look like, and what should we levy uh, for special assessments? By then, you're a fully resident control board monitoring the cost of you know, maintaining the property owned by the CDD in the community. So the O&M budget is set every year based on the cost of maintaining property. Uh, and one more question is, is that um, at what point, and I think that you covered it, but at what point does the developer have to inform the buyer that this is going to be included and in, possibly be included in the package? When they walk into that sales center, so, the, the, the first contact, uh, uh, you know, it's when they make inquiry as to buying in that subdivision. So you're, you're saying if I was a developer and I have uh, going to develop the 2,500 acres and I basically have sold all 25 of these acres and now, now I come back and all of a sudden I want a uh, CD, CDD, I got a problem. You, you do, you do. And typically what happens is a landowner comes to you and creates the CDD while he owns all the land. So um, the requirement to let all of the potential buyers, the home buyers know is there from day one. You, the petition before you is slightly different. And I'll be honest, in 25 years that I've been doing CDD work, I haven't seen this particular situation. The landowner is selling lots. That's correct. And um, I'll even be more honest, it's gonna be interesting because now it's, like I said, it's a local government. So if he sold 50 lots, I'm gonna have 50 people at all the board meetings, and it, it's not typical for that to happen. What I do understand this developer has done is had each um, lot purchaser, because no homes have been built yet, there's no roads, there's no infrastructure, right. they are each signing an affidavit, which is notarized, um, that basically acknowledges that they will be buying in a CDD. In fact, I raised that point uh, in prepping for this evening's meeting um, with the lawyer that is that um, is working with the landowner to establish the petition, that you know each of those consents. It's it's very unusual to sell your lots before the CDD is established. They know that they are getting a piece of paper signed by those landowners acknowledging that a CDD is being established and. Now, those landowners will be getting notices of all the meetings. They'll be getting notices of, um, you know, what's going on at the CDD. Um, and so it's, they've created their little um, situation for themselves. But well, it, um, they did create the government after Yeah, as fact. I studied this, I mean, those that, uh, is, is there um, the, the purchaser, do you think? Uh, have a way out of this process in this? Uh... Well, it's my understanding that um, while there have been lot purchases, I don't know if any closings have taken place. I haven't found that out. Richard, do you know? Okay. Um, so, I mean, we could find that out, uh, but I am being told that they're signing the affidavit that tells me that money is changing hands because I wouldn't need an affidavit from someone if they're not a landowner. I'm it would be interesting because uh, we would need to know that where is that going to leave the buyer in this process. Right, right. That's all I have. Member Jordan. 
Yeah, thank you. You gave us a lot of information. I did. Sure. A I great did. Deal. Uh, first question, um, and, and I believe what I know is that all the landowners so far, specific landowners, they, they put a down payment on it, but they haven't paid any more than that. Okay. My, my big question, though, is is assessment based on the size of the lot or is assessment based on what they potentially will build on the lot? Um, typically, in, in, at this stage of the game, they haven't adopted a methodology yet for special assessments. What you will typically see um, in some of the residential developments being done right now, you have a lot size, mm -hmm. and be it 40, 50, 60 feet. Um, and um, one of those lot sizes will be picked as your standard size. The, it'll typically be the predominant unit size. Mm -hmm. And that'll be assigned an assessment unit of one. And then so if you're the, say the 50 foot unit is the base unit, a 40 will be a little bit less, a 60 will be a little bit more. Um, so they take that into account and then it's basically what you can build on the 40, 50, or 60 foot lot will determine um, you know, what your assessment level is. It's, it's not what you build on it, it's these will be fixed non ad valorem and what that means is not based on value. So if it's a $100,000 house, 150, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. it's based on your lot size. Uh, lot size. Okay, the, um, I don't know, this got me a little concerned as you were talking about it. When you have an organization who has decided to do this, typically in your experience, is this because they need money to build the infrastructure or is just just another way for them to finance the infrastructure? I don't have an answer for that one. Uh, like I said, I've never run across this before. Um, I don't know what is motivating them to do that. Um, uh, selling the a few lots up front isn't going to be generating a, right. uh, a substantial amount of cash. They're buying more of a headache than anything, but why they're doing it, I do not know. The, the governance portion of it is kind of interesting to me because you're basically saying uh, the majority of all of the board members is going to be from the developer. Yes, initially until that board starts transitioning to residential control, it's based on um, acreage owned. One acre, one boat. So if, um, if say there's 2,000 acres and you own all the land but for uh, 100 homes, you got 100 votes there because it's uh, one lot, one vote. But then you got, say there's uh, 1,900 acres left. Right, right. You know, you don't, the developer won't lose control of his board right. um, until um, you get to that threshold, which is typically, it's 250 residents or um, the sixth sixth year is when it starts. I, I just find it interesting because you you really have the board is the developer, and so they are definitely going to vote the way they need to vote in order to make. Some yes, money, right? but so that is absolutely um, typical with respect to CDDs. Um, you know, your landowner is the one that's going to be laying out all the streets and the amenities and where the stormwater ponds are. Um, and they are basically um, taking the risk because their land is being assessed. Mm -hmm. And they bear the most risk until homes are sold. So yes, they are in control of the board, they're in control of the development, which is no different than any other development that is without a CDD. Um, in that they're taking all the risk when they go to the lender for their R&D loan. Um, here, it's they're dealing with different investors. They're dealing with the bond investment community. So, you know, who they're answering to is a little bit different, but the CDD truly is just a financing technique. And when it comes down to it, if they overburden their lots with a too high assessment, nobody's gonna buy. Right. And if they do that, no investor is going to um, invest in it because there are norms that the investors have set after the financial crisis that basically they look for. So you have those two control mechanisms dictating just what level of assessments are going to probably be on the homes. Okay, now last question is, and it may be for Richard, 
we don't have a say so as far as them being able to do it and not being able to do it. The law says they can do it, correct? You have to do an ordinance creating the CDD. Part, right. But as far as what the law says, you know, yeah, we can decide to, to do an ordinance. Um, it's totally up to them to go forward with this. They will file a petition and can contain their statutory criteria you consider when you look at that petition, and then it can only be created by you through an ordinance. Okay. Yeah, and once you create it, it is an independent special district. They don't come back to you ever again. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor. So what are the downsides to a CDD? Well, um, the downside is the developer doesn't sell any homes. And that risk is on him and on the investors that buy the CDD bonds. Um, and we saw that in spades. Um, I guess no pun intended, but um, in the financial crisis. Yeah. Um, because home sales stopped, land values went to zero, and home builders just walked on contracts. And so um, the investors took it on the chin. And um, that was probably one of my busier uh, uh, periods of practice because of the, uh, the workouts, the sheer number of workouts that had to be done. Now, you got to believe that the investment community is smarter in their being a little bit more responsible and um, in how they look at what improvements are being financed and you know, being a little bit more realistic. The bond issues have clearly gotten smaller. Okay. And, and that is because they want smaller chunks. Um, before, you would see, well, I'm going to build out this community in five years, and so I'm going to borrow five years' worth of money to build roads and um, infrastructure. You'll see that shrinking down. How many homes now can you sell in phase one? Um, and let's just take it smaller in smaller chunks so there's less risk. And... Um, and it's those lower leverage ratios that you see now. So if he doesn't pay his special assessments, mm -hmm. there's some real value there left. And so the investors basically get, have the right to um, basically have that land sold off to someone else that can develop it. So the market is basically building in the protections that um, were caused by the financial crisis. And hopefully they'll, they've learned their lesson and and uh, the market is controlling a lot of that. Okay. Okay. Member Stokel. Yep. Thank you. That was a lot of information. And it, it, it was. You have my brain churning here with wanting to know more. But I'm only going to ask a couple questions right now. Um, so just to clarify, these will be additional fees that these homeowners would pay in addition to already their property taxes, ad valorem, in addition, correct? Correct. Okay. And then the city does not do anything ever within nope. this district roads, nope. in fact it doesn't show up on uh, as city of titusville special assessments the special assessments on the tax bill is you know um no name community development district and you'll have a debt assessment on the tax bill and you'll have an operating and maintenance once there's something to operate and maintain you'll have okay. a separate line item for an o and m assessment they have to the property owner has to pay his own tax the entire tax bill so it'll be the city county school board and CDDs on the tax bill that has to get paid. Okay, and if there are issues, there's complaints about a road or whatnot, they go to their elected board? Yes, now, if, if it's the city of Titusville's policy that uh, a, a developer is to build the roads to city standards and then dedicate them, then if the city's maintaining those roads because they own them, then it would be the city's responsibility. If the CDD owns the roads, mm -hmm. then it's up to the Board of Supervisors to maintain them. In fact, uh, this afternoon, um, working with a, a CDD um, that's been around for years and years and years, um, that is you know, basically resurfacing all of its roads because they own them. And so they um, basically do that through their O&M assessments and decide uh, fully controlled residential board in you know, their control of their destiny and how they pay for it and how they maintain the improvements in that district. So who decides if they're going to be city maintained or maintained by the CDD? It's whatever your development code requires. Do we know that as of right now? 
Well, if they gated community and they're going to be private roads, then it will be private. Other than so that, it would not be, be us at all. Okay, the for our community, no, it would be the private community. Okay, and then so they have their board. Who's like in charge of making sure the roads actually get done? Like they have their board, but is there like we have our city manager? Do they have? Yes. Okay. In in fact, that probably I should have slowed down at that point. Um, all of the money from the bonds go to a, um, a corporate bond trustee, and that money sits in the trust account um, and is actually requisitioned out. Um, if the district is building the roads, they'll get pay apps, uh, pay applications, just like a developer would. Um, and um, if the developer hires um, ABC Paving Company, that pay app will come in, they'll review it, and the district's manager, just like a city, um, they have a, they'll have a district council. Okay. Um, they will have a district manager, and all of okay. that's reviewed. That requisition is submitted to the trustee after the board has approved it, and those bills get paid. Um, some developers choose to put in all the infrastructure um, and pay for all of that, and then sell the completed in, uh, infrastructure to the CDD. At that point in time, the, um, the CDD will usually wait to raise the bond issue until all the improvements are done. And then, um, it's, then there's an acquisition of roads, sewer, water pipes, whatever was financed, um, and it'll be paid for in one lump sum on the day of acquisition. Okay, that's all I have for now, thanks. Perfect. Member Jordan. Yeah, one other question. I, I was just thinking about this. So you've got the CDD that you have to pay for on an annual basis, or they can spread it out for 12 uh, months, I assume. CDDs are collected on the tax bill. So those special like assessments would right. just okay. be paid um, just like the tax bill. It comes due in November, goes delinquent in March. So um, th if it's a homeowner we're talking about, homeowner pays his taxes whenever they want to. Right. Um, if it's the developer, sometimes um, uh, the, what the CDD will do when there's just one landowner, instead of running it all through the tax collector's office, and I mean, tax collector um, charges a cost to put tax um, assessments on the tax roll and all that. Sometimes they'll just direct bill it to the landowner until their homes in, in the district. Um, in that case, a developer may you know pay it in chunks, but typically a homeowner will be paying special assessments with its tax bill once a year. Okay, so you got your Apple earned taxes, you got the CDD, and you got an HOA fee. Yes, there are, there are circumstances yeah. where HOAs um, uh, are in addition to the CDD, right. and what I've seen is HOAs then will take uh, control of the architectural review side of the, um, you know, just making sure the houses are painted all the uniform colors and um, whatever ARCs typically do, mm -hmm. but you typically don't um, see uh, overlap of responsibilities. Um, so if you, the CDD is going to be the usually uh, responsible for the heftier infrastructure um, and HOAs be um, used for, um, HOAs would be used for maintaining anything the developer chooses not to finance through the CDD. Say the community pool, mm -hmm. he wants that um, just for community residents. Well, you can't put that in a CDD right. because then now you have a public pool. So the, um, amenity center might be owned by the HOA. Um, but those are the, you know, the basically the balancing act that the developer would have to um, think about in what improvements are financed by what entity. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think that's everything there. Um, so with that, no more questions. We move on. Thank you. Sure. City and Manager. any questions whatsoever? You can get them Move to through. Mr. Broom, Correct. and I'll be happy to answer anything else. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. City Manager. Uh, last item is item G, which are letters of appreciations we've received uh, this month. Uh, the entire Public Works Department management staff, Lori Roberts, for Development Specialist from uh, Community Development, and Police Officer Willie Taylor from the Police Department. Very good. Thank you very much. 
How do you know? <laughs> Petitions and requests. All right, I'd like that hand out, hand out be made. There you go. Thank you very much. It's a handout you were to receive. He's moving it. She's moving it. Stan, yeah. I very much like your sign. <laughs> okay, but I you did it. Listen, I appreciate you what you did with the uh, disabilities, and I know you worked oh, okay, very hard okay. on that. That's I appreciate that very much. I have Thank I have a, I had a disabled child too. So Thank you. So, uh, All right, let's go. Okay. All right, we're well, just about everybody got it. These two people they don't, they don't have it yet. We're though. good. They don't have it. But uh, okay, here's what we got is that uh, uh, I've sent you today a uh, an email and it goes together with uh, this this right here that you have uh, that's handed out oh, and sorry. the, uh, the your little pl uh, pink card. And what it is talking about is this this handout has um, uh, is is together with this email has 21 uh, I called it atrocities. And the first paragraph says this, and I'm going to revise it because you know maybe I don't I don't sound very nice when I uh, say things. It says, and this is is this is. Uh, this is about engineering atrocities. I'm a professional engineer, and uh, it's my job to uh, to uh, to tell the truth about uh, engineering issues and so forth. And we got some problems here in the city, uh, big ones. And it says it so that it begins by saying it says for outrageous, open, and notorious dishonesty, as I, as itemized below, this handout request number one, the termination of city manager Scott Larice and director of water resources Sean Stauffer, and number two. The resignation of three council members, that's Mr. Jordan, Stokel, and Nelson. Now, one thing I should put on this, or to tell the truth. The thing is, is that we've got so much dishonesty here. And for, exa for example, this is dishonesty right here, is that uh, we got, my goodness, the city sprayed, sprayed pe people with piss and poop for, for months and didn't do a thing about it, wouldn't turn, turn the fountains off. And you guys won't talk about it. It's horrible. I mean, and, and we have a, uh, we had a, a consent order, a consent order that uh, the city agreed to with FDEP that said that the city stopped putting sewage into the river uh, December the 19th. And we have even people in TEC know that's not true. And we've got photos, videos, witnesses, police department, so forth. It's not true. So you're not, so I'm saying you need to tell the truth. You're not doing it. And you're, you're damaging the environment. You're hurting the people. It's a lose-lose situation for the voters. It's a lose-lose situation for the community when you're not when you're not being honest. And and what I did recently is when I presented to you, I, I gave you a comparison with Bernie Madoff and what he did, and the harm that he did to people. Similarly, you're doing the same thing, similar to what Mr. Madoff did. However, in Mr. Madoff's case, what, it, what he had a situation was they had some hidden, hidden uh, like, uh, smoking guns. But in the situation of Titusville, we don't have hidden smoking guns. It's all open, notorious dishonesty. And I've got about 19 of the, these 21 things are open, notorious dishonesty by the city. I'll ask you for more time. time. Okay, thank you. All right, I see none. Uh, anything else? There better not be. <laughs> All right, we will uh, reconvene at uh, 7.40 p.m. Thank you.